two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yes, hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with Mark and James. Um, and uh, if you're watching on YouTube, just another quick plug for our mug, which I still don't have a mug. There we go. There it is. The excellent item itself. Yeah, beautiful. Very nice. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, if you've signed up to um, our Patreon, if you've become a subscriber and a supporter of the podcast, you've got a good chance of winning a mug. So we're sending a mug out at least one a month, probably two, um, as soon as we get uh, some more supplies, as soon as I get one, um, to people who are signing up to Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast. I'll give one to John if he fills it up with coffee for me. He'll do it. <laughs> He'll do anything for a mug. So, uh, yeah, you're on. He's going to, not now, though. You make too much noise off screen. Um, okay, look, we're... We occasionally talk about mindfulness on the on the podcast, and we know it's um, uh, it's an important thing to be in the right place mentally uh, to function and to work, particularly when you work by yourself and writing in the creative space. And there's a lot of talk about this uh, and a lot of um, thinking that goes into this. Was that you yawning? Yeah. Because we're about to talk about yeah. sleep. Yeah, another bad night's sleep for Mark, unfortunately. Was that because of the children? Yes, it was. That's, that's always the answer to that question. Yes. Yeah. Well, I've had two bad nights. So we're staying in a hotel over here in, in um, Salisbury. And, you know, you never particularly sleep well in hotels. I don't. Um, certainly not the first night. But I've had two bad nights sleep. And um, it does, without question, affect your ability to, A, obviously, just energy levels in terms of work. But I think also in terms of the creative process, you do need parts of your brain to be functioning pretty well to create um, now, we're going to talk about sleep specifically then with Anne Bartolucci, who's our guest today. Uh, and Anne does uh, a lot of writing on this subject. She's an author herself, fiction author as well as non-fiction author in terms of talking about things like sleep. Uh, she's got a new book coming out uh, on how to get better sleep patterns to help your productivity. So we're going to talk to Anne and then there's, uh, she's put together an excellent PDF giveaway, which you heard me refer to in the interview. And uh, we'll give you the URL for that at the end. So let's hear from Anne first. Uh, my name is Anna Bartolucci. I'm a clinical health psychologist and behavioral sleep medicine specialist. So most of my day is spent helping people sleep without drugs. I also write as author Cecilia Dominic. Uh, I write urban fantasy, new adult contemporary, and steampunk. Oh, okay. So a reasonable um, uh, cross of books. So how long have you been writing? Well, my mother claims that she has a story I wrote when I was two. Um, I have yet to see the story. But uh, seriously, since about 2003, that's when I really started working on my craft, going to conferences and things, and then I broke out in 2013. Okay, so you broke out. That's when you got published or when you published yourself? or uh, That's when I got the email from my editor at Sam Hain Publishing. And uh, she emailed me and said, hey, is this book still available? And I clutched the edge of my desk and said, holy crap, I think this is it. And my husband's like, what's going on? So I said she wants the book. So he calmed me down and I sent her the book. And uh, yes, I had seven books published with Sam Hain before they closed this past February. Wow. OK, brilliant. And uh, yes, yeah, so they closed. What are you doing now? So I got this wonderful gift of seven edited novels, and I'm currently in the process of putting them back out myself. Okay, great. It's, it's always great to do the self-publishing thing when you've got a back catalogue to work Definitely. with. Definitely. Yeah, my goal is one a month this year. We'll see how that works. Yeah, it's, you're going to be busy, but um, but good luck with that. So, Anna, we are, we're here to talk really about the mind, about sleep and productivity, I think is is something uh, I guess you have to practice as a writer, but something you have a clinical background in as well. Correct. So I was going to say, as you can tell, I'm a fairly busy person. Um, so yes, I've definitely had to implement some of these strategies myself. And I will admit, I am better at some of them than I am at others. That's the old thing about physician heal thyself. Heal thyself. Uh, but there's, exactly. there's um, absolutely uh, no reason. In fact, the only way you'd be good at telling people how to do things if 
we're all flawed right it's all nobody's perfect and you struggle with the same challenges that we do but i know because i had a sneak peek of your brilliant pdf that we're giving out uh, to go with this what we're going to talk about and i think it's superb so i'm looking forward to this and we always say on our podcast we want it to be of value to people uh, not to waste their time their precious time listening and so i think let's just crack on because i can see some really good tips with that and i know your first thing you're going to say that we need to look after is a five letter word yes that would be sleep so um yeah essentially that is one of our biggest challenges in modern society both because we are all so busy so we don't give ourselves adequate opportunity to sleep and then there's also the issue of the fact that we have all of these things going on around us up until bedtime that keep us from being able to get good quality sleep yeah and that's not been helped by the advent of the digital age um and i'm probably one of a billion parents on the planet who currently struggle with trying to get children to have a break and have gaps and and limit their digital time but actually probably don't look after myself in that way in the same way uh exactly yeah so you have to be the one who sets the example damn okay yeah (laughs) <laughs> that makes that makes sense. And what j- just going to basics here? I mean, I know some of this should be self-evident, but what is the problem with being busy? Whether it's face into an iPhone or whatever it is, ahead of sleep. Uh, so we have this strange concept that you know, once we get past childhood and past all of those wonderful childhood bedtime routines, that we can just go 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 through our day, hit the bed, fall asleep, and that's it. And we are just not wired like that. So it can be very helpful to do a few things. Um, You know, first have an actual pre-bedtime routine. And part of that pre-bedtime routine should definitely be shutting off all backlit screens, whether that's television, smartphones, tablets, computers. Um, You know, these things, we use them all the time and we have this variable reinforcement response with them. Like, you know, when you log on to Facebook, for example, you don't know if you're going to find that gem of an article that is going to help you discover something new. Uh, but, you know, 90% of the time you don't. But is that, you know, 10% of the time that you find something really valuable that keeps you going back to do it. So there's, there's a problem there for two reasons. First, it keeps your brain in receptive mode and reactive mode. And then also, yes, you have that blue light exposure, which then suppresses melatonin, the sleep hormone, which then keeps you from getting good quality sleep. Okay, and you're including in that tablets. And the reason I say that a little bit hesitantly is that I have a bedtime reading routine. Actually, the advent of the Kindle Paperwhite has been a bit of a boon for me because I can read it in the dark. As I, and it helps me go to sleep. And I, read, I don't read a huge amount at that point. I read five or six pages. But it's something, I, I, for me, it feels like part of my routine and helps me get off. Right. And um, unfortunately, the Kindle Paperwhite, even though you can turn the lights way, way, way down low, there is still some of that blue light signal present. So um, typically for people, I recommend that they go with, ta-da, for people listening at home, I'm holding up the old school non-backlit Kindle. So this is just the regular e-ink Kindle. So you can still get an access to your library, but you're not getting that blue light signal. And if you're concerned about um, waking up a bed partner, some of the cases like this one come with lights. Uh, And then, of course, there's also the possibility of going old school and reading paper books. Remember those? I do remember those fondly. But uh, yeah, no, my thing is, um, is I tend to go to bed after my wife and it would be antisocial of me to turn the lights on and, and read a paper back hence the paper white but that's a very interesting comment the way around really it's about the blue light so i'm assuming the little yellow light from a case doesn't have the same chemical effect on me correct okay okay that's a good tip um there's another curious thing you put in your handout was about the duration of sleep uh, a sort of a bit of a myth mm-hmm. about how much sleep we need Yes, people have this concept that they need this magical number of eight hours every single night in order to sleep, function, and not die. You know, people come into my office and they're really, really super attached to that eight hour number. Whereas normal adult sleep is anywhere from seven to nine hours. And if you think about it, our sleep need varies between individuals. So, for example, 
I'm an eight to eight and a half hour sleeper. I know that's my sleep need. My husband, on the other hand, he's a six to seven hour sleeper. And so if he tries to sleep my schedule, like for example, when we're traveling, we don't have you know all those options for separate pre-bedtime routines. Um, he will actually have insomnia on the third or fourth night because he's maybe gotten a little bit too much sleep or he doesn't need as much. Um, also, it varies within individual. So for example, I'm a runner. And so I've noticed that, you know, nights after a race or after I've done a long training run, I need more sleep those nights than I do maybe other nights when I've been a little bit less active. So it's listening to your body. Exactly. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm a runner as well. So and I, I definitely noticed that uh, impacts uh, on the sleep need. I wonder how extreme that goes to, because you do get some people who would sleep. I'm not going to name anybody here. Who would sleep 10 to 12 hours every night if they got an opportunity and sleeping in the morning i kind of envy them i i definitely don't need so much but then you hear stories of i mean the one that comes to mind is that it was margaret thatcher the, the prime minister of the uk a few years ago who famously did four or five hours every night and said that's all she needed is that really true was it that is that a real outlier that is a real outlier although they do exist i've heard the same thing actually about albert einstein that he only needed four hours a night and uh, yes, I actually kind of envy those people because if I could get by with four hours of sleep a night and have that be my sleep need, I would get so much more done. Yeah, find those magic extra four or five hours a day that we all look for. Um, and I was going to mention Prince as maybe the counter to that because although we don't want to speculate on, um, I think it's all Topsy is probably out by now, but he barely slept by all accounts. In fact, by his own account, he barely slept at night. He worked all night, but there's somebody who suffered an early death probably lots of other complications in that but um not necessarily healthy in that extreme right yeah no michael jackson died because he wasn't able to get good sleep and he died in his quest for good sleep okay so before we move uh, on from sleep um one or two of the other things that we should be looking for you, you you're referring to this routine can you flesh that out a little bit what sort of things should we be doing ah oh, okay great question so for example I will typically recommend that an hour before bed, people go through their evening, um, I guess, pajama and brushing teeth routine. Um, some people find it helpful to take a warm bath or shower because that will drive body temperature up. And then as the body cools, it's actually a signal to sleep. Um, and then for the rest of that hour, do something relaxing. So, you know, if you tend to have a prayer or meditation routine, that's a great time to do it. I'm assuming you're not gonna fall asleep during it. Or to do something low-key, like reading something that's maybe entertaining, but that you're not going to be unable to put down. Or, um, you know, a lot of my millennial patients who aren't necessarily big readers, although I am trying to convert them, they'll do things like listen to podcasts and color. So it's still mentally engaging and relaxing. Color. Color. So yes, adult coloring books. I don't know if they've taken off as much in the UK as they have here, but yes, they're big. Yeah, I mean, they're here. I don't know if they are as big as they are in the States. And I have to say, this is not something I've even tried yet. But you're, you think that for some people, you see it as being a part of their relaxing routine? Yes, because it can be a very mindful activity, because you really do have to focus on getting the colors and the, you know, in the little lines. And with the adult covering books, they do tend to be very intricate designs. Um, it also might be pulling in some parts of the brain that you're not necessarily using the rest of the time. Maybe I'll give it a go. We'll see if they have some um, Star Wars coloring books. I'm sure they do in that. Oh, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. um, what about napping? It seems to be quite trendy at the moment, napping. Um, I will admit I'm a big fan of napping. I have a nice comfy couch in my office that will get used occasionally. But if you're going to nap, um, first make sure it's not going to impact your sleep at night. And typically people will know that if they nap during the day that they have more trouble at night. But if you do nap, try to make it less than half an hour. You know, 15 to 20 minutes tends to be the ideal. And the reason for that is that we go through different sleep stages when we sleep, whether it's daytime or nighttime. And so if you're napping more than 20 to 30 minutes, you're going into deep, slow wave sleep, which is the most physically restoring sleep. And so it sounds like, well, yeah, I want to do that while I nap. The problem is if you do that during the day, the body's kind of like, well, check, I've already done that. And so it'll be more difficult to do it at night. 
Not to mention if you wake up out of that type of sleep, that's when you get kind of the nap hangover, where you take a nap and you almost feel worse than when you went to sleep to begin with. Yeah, I don't think there's any avoiding feeling a bit ropey after a nap, but I've yeah, if I have done it, and I haven't, it has not become a routine with me, I quite like it to, I might work on it. If I have done it an hour or half an hour to an hour after the nap, that's when it comes back to me. But yeah, you all, I mean, I don't think anybody wakes up from even a 20 minute nap feeling bing, it's always a little bit, but that, that seems okay. Yeah, it, w- it will usually take me about five, 10 minutes after a 15 to 20 minute nap to really start feeling the benefits of it. But you know, some people, and that's another misconception of sleep, is that people think that they don't get a good night's sleep if they don't just wake up, ready to jump out of bed and tackle the day. But you know, some people are just never going to do that. Some people are just always going to take, you know, half an hour to an hour to really get going in their morning. Yeah, not all of us are morning people. In fact, they, um, that's not a good combination of person, of people, the one who's um, bright and breezy first thing in the morning the one who needs that hour we uh we have a household with a daughter who is not a morning person so we're learning that at the moment um just on the subject of napping i mean i have a friend who had for a period of time an extraordinarily high pressure job um very um very intense and he used napping all the time he used it in a car journey for five minutes he would nap it was the only way he really got through those sort of six or seven years of that job and I saw it as a quite a power I don't I don't think anyone trained him to do it in fact it almost became natural for him because he was so exhausted all the time but um, I saw the power of it in keeping him going and how the body would adapt to that okay so um, moving on you've I know you've put a couple of kind of workarounds that we can think about if we're trying to plan and trying to find in this modern world a way of getting these routines going yeah mm-hmm So, you know, of course, the biggest challenge for a lot of people is that discontinuing blue light, and I actually recommend discontinuing it within two hours of bedtime, just to give your brain that time to relax and recharge. One of the workarounds that will help you to use blue light to within an hour of bedtime is something called blue light blocking glasses. And um, let's see, aha, these are the ones that I use at home. So people at home, these are, they essentially look kind of like yellow grandma sunglasses. So they fit over my regular specs. Um, I will admit they are not sexy. So the first night I wore them when my husband and I were watching television, he turned around and looked at me, he said, wow, don't they make those in any more attractive models? <laughs> I told him, no, turn around, watch television. Uh, but one of the unexpected advantages is we were watching uh, Doctor Who and it was the episode where they're in like the head of the Daleks cavern or whatever. And I remember my father, yes. I remember my father complaining about television shows and movies that were set at night or in dark places because it's so hard to see. These actually help a lot. So they can actually enhance the television watching experience, which some people are worried about. Um, And I usually recommend that people will wear them, you know, in that one, between two and one hour before bed. Um, There are also some filters that you can get for your devices. Um, iPhones and iPads have something on them called night shift and you get to it through brightness. Um, I recommend that you turn it all the way warm, so as yellow and warm as possible and have it set to go on at sunset and on or off at sunrise. Also for Macs, uh, PCs, and Android devices, there's a program called Flux, and it's spelled F dot L-U-X. It's a free program. You can download it, and it will also automatically turn those screens yellow, or in the case of Mac, funky orange at sunset. Okay. We should say that um, most people listen to the podcast rather than watch it, so we just described the glass. It was like a, a, a fairly sort of large-ish pair of sunglasses plastic frames with the yellow light i can remember winning in a raffle years ago night vision glasses for driving which seemed like a random thing but they were looked actually very similar to that yes actually these are the um the ones that i have are the as seen on tv and their blue light blocking and night vision driving glasses yeah okay and i have a pair of sports um uh sunglasses that I use for cricket which we often play in fading light and they're yellow lenses and it and people are always amazed when I say try them on how much more light you get through um through them so it's actually quite a nice light as well okay good well there's some good practical tips 
Anna, thank you very much uh, for that. Let's press on through this. I want to ask you about the whole digital stuff. We've touched on it already, but it is something that previous generations simply didn't have to deal with. And you watch an adaptation of Pride and Prejudice and they did a little bit of taking a turn around the room and playing the harpsichord in the evening and then sitting quietly reading. So things were a little bit easier in the 18th century. Today, the distractions are phenomenal, aren't they? Oh yes, uh, definitely. Yes, I mentioned earlier the dopamine release and the rewards in these devices. Of course, the people who manufacture them want us to be addicted to them because then we'll continue buying them and we'll continue using them and soon they become indispensable. Like, could you imagine life without your smartphone? No, but, but the way you're describing it is very similar to the way drug dealers operate, right? Exactly. <laughs> First app's free. So... Yes, so we have these little devices and, you know, if you think about, you know, not even necessarily back to the 1800s, although that might be sort of a more ideal time, but even back to, say, the 1990s. So if you recall, when we used to check our email, we had to go to the computer, sit down, dial up, and, you know, it made that lovely modem noise that some of us remember all too well. And so we would check our emails and we would answer them and then we would go about our day. And now our emails kind of check us. So we are carrying around our devices. Sometimes our devices are attached to our devices on our wrists that also give us notifications. Yep. Yes, I deliberately got one. So um, I'm showing you guys, it looks like a regular watch. It's actually a fitness tracker that only allows phone calls and text message notifications to come through very sensible not emails yes so it's kind of hard to keep the brain in optimal productive mode if you're expecting an alert at any moment you know I heard a interview uh, a while ago with a neurologist who says that the alerts on our phones activate that deep primitive part of the brain that used to respond with for example a wrestling in the bushes and you need to respond to the wrestling in the bushes because it's either something you want to eat or something that wants to eat you. But, you know, most of the time in our email or our social media, it's not either of those things, although, you know, there are plenty of political debates to be had if, if you're into that. But, you know, typically it's, hey, buy this thing, or um, your package is going to be delivered tomorrow. And so what we need to do is really just start taking control of our smartphone time or our device time. And on the handout, I do say smartphone management, smartphone being two words, not one, that's not a typo. And so one thing to do is to wait until after breakfast to look at your emails and texts and social media stuff. You know, I'm guessing that for a lot of people, if somebody really wants to get a hold of them, they will still call or you can try to set that expectation. But as for the rest of it, by waiting until after breakfast, you give your brain time to get really set in productive mode rather than receptive mode. Um, also, I will recommend that people turn off their alerts. Um, my social media apps are all, always bugging me. It's like, hey, turn on alerts so you'll know when such and such happens. And I'm like, nope, go away. Um, on my smartphone, I don't even have email badges. So I don't get the little red number when I get an email. I actually have to go and tap on little icon uh, and so kind of trying to mimic the little dot winking at you the whole time saying read me read me you've turned you've disabled that so you don't know whether you've got unread emails there i don't no well you could be like john dyer who at any one time has about two and a half thousand unread emails so it just doesn't matter to him <laughs> right <laughs> so if you're not the type of person who can just ignore them <laughs> okay well that's i mean that's good and technically um the same thing could be achieved for a period of time, I guess, by shifting into airplane mode or um, uh, there's a night time, it's called now on the iPhone at least, it's a kind of nighttime mode which you can enable, which cuts out all the beeps and noises and notifications during that time. And you can set that to either be a schedule thing or turn it on and off manually. Right, yeah, I actually have mine on um, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., which is typically when I'm seeing patients because obviously I don't have my phone doing that then. Yeah, that seems sensible. Okay, I realise how much of this I'm doing wrong, by the way, Anna. So, uh, you know, checking emails before breakfast, that's a terrible habit that I have. First thing I'll do, come down here, do a little bit of work, then go and have breakfast, and um, I need to have a better routine in the morning. I'm going to 
do better in the future. Okay, so we like that. I would guess probably... So I would guess probably a lot of your viewers and listeners roll over and look at their phones for the emails and the social media first thing. So at least you still you do have a little bit of a space. Yeah. And this stuff is important, right? Getting small changes to your routine will start to make a difference to your alert levels. And ultimately, we want to be good creative people and turn out good quality work. And so there is a direct correlation, right, between getting this right and the type of levels of alertness you're going to have when you're creating. Right, yes, our brains were not designed to do two things at once. And so if the brain is always alert and listening for something to happen, it is really hard for it to do productive, creative things. When, isn't it we're always told that women can multitask and men can't? And that's another myth, is it? It is a myth, yes. And the more we study multitasking, the more we find we really it's really not the most efficient way of doing things. Like. For example, you're more likely to miss something and then make more mistakes and then end up actually being more frustrated and behind than you were when you started. Yeah. Okay. Um, something else you mentioned in the notes, which I found interesting, was about using, being aware of your alert levels for different types of creative work. You know, a lot of people have a morning writing routine and they don't really know why. They just know it's easier to create in the morning. And part of that reason is because that's when their brain is still, you know, shifting out of sleep. Your inner editor is somewhat asleep, or that's how it feels for me. And so actually less alert equals more creative. On the other hand, if you're going to be doing things for marketing or if you're doing more analytical work like editing, then aiming for a more alert time during the day would be more advantageous. So. Uh, for example, for me, I tend to draft in the morning and then edit in the evenings. Um, ideally, um, I would edit during the middle of the day because that's really my peak alertness time. But, you know, of course, I'm doing that other job. So it's really being familiar with your own, your own mind and your own preferences and aiming for uh, your alert versus not so alert times for these things. So do you think you think that during the less alert times, our brains are potentially more open to abstract thoughts and our more alert times, they want to do more practical things? Hence, you're leaning towards drafting, coming up with stories and notes when you're less alert, but editing when you're alert. Yes, there's actually a lot of research that when people are less alert, they are better at insight type questions. So the types of questions that really require you to make that creative leap. Whereas um, during more alert times, they're better at the analytical stuff. Okay. That must explain why John Dyer is so creative, because he's never alert. <laughs> okay. Let's um, let's move on. Um, there was something uh, that you mentioned about procrastination, which is on the handout, but I think we'll need a bit of explanation from you because I didn't grasp it first time. What are you, are you getting at when you talk about fear? And what was it? I come with the exact phrase now. Fear and avoidance. Right. So if you think about it, procrastination is you're putting off doing something that you need to do. And we do it for different reasons, but it all comes down to fear and avoidance. And there are different types that manifest themselves. So, for example, you know, a lot of people are familiar with imposter syndrome or that feeling that you are going to get caught out at any moment that you actually really don't know what you're doing or you're not really a good writer or, you know, your stories are awful. You know, eventually somebody's going to figure this out. And so if you have that kind of fear, you're, of course, going to have a harder time writing. Um, and, you know, it's everybody. So I think one of the main examples that I've read about is Maya Angelou. You know, as accomplished and awarded as she is, she's talked about having this problem. Then there's also perfectionism or fear of being not perfect. You know, if you think about it before you write a book, you have this concept in your head of it's going to be this perfect, amazing story. The characters are all going to be round and you know, engaging and the plot's going to have all these amazing twists to it. And then you sit down to write it. And of course, first drafts don't meet anywhere near our expectations. 
And so we tend to put it off because, well, you know, it's really hard to look at that first draft and be like, wow, that's really not what I was trying for. And, you know, you get closer to what you're trying for in the edits, but, you know, sometimes that first step is really hard. Or let's say you have a first draft and you really don't want to see how much it sucks. And so then you put off editing. Um, then there's also boredom. So, you know, some of what we do as writers, we don't really like doing. You know, I actually kind of like marketing certain types of it. Um, a lot of people don't. And so they'll put off the marketing parts of things um, just because they just don't want to do it. Um, or, you know, it highlights skills that they don't have yet that they're going to have to put forth effort to learn. Honestly, that's kind of like me with landing pages. I still haven't figured them out yet. Um, and then finally, there is resistance. And there was this great little book that came out several years ago called The War of Art. And it's by Stephen Pressfield, who wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance. And it's a really, really good book because he really focuses in on this sort of anti-creative force that is in everybody. And it also happens when people engage in behavior change. So, for example, I often tell my patients, you know, when you're trying to establish new healthy behaviors like better sleep or healthier eating, you're going to often find that it will get a little bit worse before it gets better. And that's resistance at play. It's like, you know, our bodies and our minds don't want to change what we're doing because even if we're not happy, we get comfortable. And so that also occurs with writing. You know, you might want to write this wonderful, perfect book, but you know, there's this also opposing force against it. And this concept of resistance has been getting a lot more press lately. It's been really interesting. Yeah, it is really interesting. And I wonder, you know, I do wonder what's behind it in terms of our human makeup, why we do have this um, nagging doubt that, that can be overwhelming and can absolutely, I mean, you could have been speaking directly to me when you described it, and I'm sure that would be the same for a lot of the listeners. It stops you working. It's one of the reasons I'm so slow at my book. I'll be quite honest about that. Is this feeling that it's not good enough. And it's, yeah, it's a difficult um, thing. Yes, definitely. And actually, I got the idea to uh, contact you guys about being a resource for this topic from hearing you talk about some of your difficulties in earlier podcasts. But yes, and I think it comes out of maybe the more primitive part of the brain again, because if you think about it, back in the day, humans had to band together for survival. And so, you know, individual success was maybe even detrimental to survival because if somebody's going off and doing their own thing, as wonderful as it is, they're still not playing as part of the team. Uh, you know, to gather the food, bring down the mammoth, defend the village, whatever it is. So, you know, I think it's probably one of those old holdovers, for lack of a better term. Yeah. There's some. Uh, there's always some logic, isn't there? And it usually goes back to when we were hunter gathering out there in the field. Okay, so so you talked about um, imposter syndrome, perfectionism, boredom, and resistance. How do we solve this then, Anna? Ah, uh, yes, that is the big question, isn't it? And I so, really need to know the answer. Really need to know the answer. <laughs> Excellent. So the first thing to do is to accept it. Look, we're writers. We're going to procrastinate we're going to have these problems. Uh, the issue comes in in that the more we beat ourselves up for it, it's actually not going to motivate us. It's going to make us do it more because then you're piling feelings of failure on top of feelings of failure, which of course is about as unmotivating as you can get. So just accept, okay, you're going to procrastinate. Uh, then there is the, also the question of habit versus discipline. You know, a lot of people will look at me and say, wow, you must be really disciplined to do all that you do. And honestly, well, A, my imposter syndrome says, yeah, I really don't do that much. And B, discipline is kind of a dirty word because it's a word that puts a lot of pressure on us. So the thing to do is actually to establish habits. And they don't necessarily need to be everyday habits. You know, you hear that you should write every day. Well, you know, for some of us like me, with really busy day jobs, that's just not possible. And so it's getting to the habit that, okay, when I go through these sequence of things, this is when it's time to write. So I know you have a certain kind of music that you like to listen to while you write. So that's probably a signal that engages that habit. 
Um, some people do find it useful to write at the same time every single day or in the same place or you know sometimes even wearing the same things you know some people have their writing socks so it's establishing habits which you know once you've really established a good habit it feels weird if you don't do it which can then be really motivating then there's also structured procrastination so this wow. is something that i found yes so make it work for you uh, this is actually a method that I was using before I figured out what the name of it was. And there is a reference on the PDF, and it's this really nice little short book called The Art of Procrastination by John Perry. He's at Stanford. And it's essentially sort of tricking your brain. And so let's say there's something you really need to do, but you've been procrastinating on it. So what you need to do is figure out something else that you really need to do that you want to procrastinate more and then you'll use that one task that you really need to do to procrastinate the other task. You just need to you know, tell yourself that that other task is more important. And um, I will give writing groups talks on procrastination and often give out copies of this book. And somebody told me afterwards that it helped her son get through his high school project and her to get through her thesis wow. to use wow. this method. So and I was like, wow, that's brilliant. I wish I could have come up with it. Yeah. It, it reminds me when we talk about this that we think we're in control of our minds and we are to an extent obviously we you know we use our minds and make choices but they need to be treated as almost like a muscle on your arm if you want a big bicep you don't will it to be big you do a load of stuff that's going to make your bicep big but we don't really take that same thing the attitude to our brains but we need to we need to think about how we're developing it how we're looking after it how we're doing things to almost trick it into working for us. Exactly. Um, yes, there's actually a concept of the giving in muscle versus the, you know, resisting giving in muscle. Uh, Judith Beck, who's a very famous cognitive therapist, uses that in her program for helping people stick to their diets. It's like every time you give in, you're strengthening the wrong kind of muscle. And so that also, you know, prompts the thought of, hey, let's give ourselves credit for when we do meet our goals and we do engage in these behaviors, you know, give yourself credit for when you sit down and you write those thousand words or however many you're trying to get every day. You know, we often beat ourselves up for not doing what we haven't done, but we don't do the opposite and reinforce ourselves for accomplishing things. Because we're full of crushing self-doubt. Exactly. Okay. Yes, because if we accomplish something, the self-doubt says, oh, well, that yeah. must have just been an accident. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, Anna, look, we've been talking for 40 minutes. This has been brilliant. Um, uh, we're going to have to bring it to a wrap-up at this point, but you've, you've put together this superb PDF, as I say. I'm going to give out the link for people to download it in just a moment. Uh, and at the end of it, you've got a list of resources, so a lot of the books you've referred to are there. Now, I know you are also, at the moment, um, you've got your new book coming out on this subject, and I know you're going to do a little thing where people can get a, a sneak peek of that, yeah? Correct. So um, I'm currently in the process of writing a book for people who like to accomplish a lot of things, but their sleep gets in the way. So um, I'm going to be giving away the first few chapters, both you know to help people and also looking for feedback, if they don't mind. Um, and you can find it at my website. It's www.sleepyinvatl.com. So S L E E P Y I N T H E A T L dot com forward slash better sleep. And the link will also be on the PDF. Yeah, we'll put it on the PDF, and uh, I'll mention it again in a moment when uh, when Mark and I wrap up this podcast. Um, Anna, thank you so much indeed. We have been trusting you. You're a doctor. You've been subliminally flashing that um, message at us on your mug through the podcast. Oh, yes, no. Trust so me, I'm the doctor. If you're watching the video, you can see we've got... There's also a sort of possibly a white leopard or a bulldog over your left shoulder, which is all another reason. Uh, yes, that is my... Um, yes, and actually, I'm backwards. There you go. And a Dalek. Ah, yes, a big Doctor Who fan. That's coming, becoming clear. There you go. Many reasons to uh, to watch this episode on our YouTube channel um, as well as listen to it. Uh, Anna, thank you so much indeed. It's been really interesting and uh, definitely usable 
uh, material. So let's see, uh, let's all keep each other honest now and start implementing some of these things and see what difference it makes to our, uh, our productivity. Thank you, James. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, good stuff from Anne. I mean, um, we all need sort of professional help in various areas of our life, whether it's getting some building work done in your house or thinking about the way that you sleep and you perform. Yeah, absolutely. Sleep is very important, obviously, stating the bleeding obvious there, but anything um, that we can get to improve the amount of sleep that we get and also the quality of sleep that we get is is obviously going to be um, very, very useful. And it's as you're right, it's, it's, it's especially important for creative people um, who need their brains to be functioning at a high level. Um, I don't feel like my brain's functioning at anywhere near like a high level at the moment. So, um, yeah, I'll be uh, I'll be getting that PDF for sure. Yeah, so the PDF, if you want it, which is uh, Brain Hacks to Help You Sleep, um, is being put together by Anne. And also in the email that we send out that will deliver the PDF, we'll give you a link to sign up to Anne's list and get the first three chapters of our new book on sleep um, free of charge. So uh, we'll send that out to you. So if you just go along to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash sleep, nice easy one, uh, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash sleep sleep and you can get that pdf uh, which you heard me referring to in the interview which is hacks to get better sleep patterns and better productivity uh, we've got more recording to do today so you need to um we need to get that mug filled with coffee we do yes absolutely strong double espresso triple espresso i'm not sure that's on the hack actually uh, <laughs> alcohol. pdf yeah <laughs> i think alcohol is definitely not on it um, we should also say we went out for dinner last night we did we had some, a nice couple of carafes of wine which doesn't help you sleep, I don't think. Probably not, no. I didn't have any wine. I can't use that excuse. It was gin for me. Oh, gin. And then lager shandy. We it noticed. Was, yes. The, um, the waitress um, told on you. How did she? Yes. We said, what, what's he drinking? He said, she said, lager shandy, which is like um, very <laughs> weak beer. Uh, so there you go. We can't all be men. I'm a professional. Anywhere recording today. You're a what? A professional. I'm a professional. <laughs> Are you still drunk, Dawson? A little bit. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for listening today. Um, I don't think we're great examples to the sleep patterns that Anne was talking about, but um, the PDF will help us all hopefully sort ourselves out. Selfpublishingformula.com forward slash sleep. And we'll see you next week. You've been listening to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.